America, my name is Ayame Ose Frimpong, and you are watching The Black Athenians. And today we're going to talk about the federal job guarantee. And I say the federal job guarantee because uh, it's important to get my people working. And there's nothing, wrong, there's nothing wrong with having a job. There's nothing wrong with having a job as long as you're not a slave, right? So uh, we're going to talk about what a federal job guarantee means to the black community, the history of the federal job guarantee as a racial justice project, and we're gonna and potentials for this federal job guarantee to happen um, because it needs to happen for us to get where we need to go. First things first, I'm going to, so we're gonna talk about figures that you probably should know, even if you don't know. Their names are A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, uh, Martin Luther King, Coretta Scott King, Richard Dean Winfield, and Sandy Darity. All, and FDR, all of these people understand the role of a good job for justice and for racial justice for black people. So we're going to get back to it, but first let's hit the opening. You got it, Matthew? Mm -hmm. To the beach, y'all. Uh, yeah. Good to me. Never change the ways for the world or the government. If it was the president, then I would state facts. You leave it up to me, I'll paint the White House black and it can feature in your front. All right, everybody. My name is Aimee Ose Frimpong, and today we're talking about the federal job guarantee as a necessary, not just sufficient, a necessary condition for justice for black people. And we're going to talk about it. First, we're going to start off with a little history lesson. So gather around, people. We're going to talk about a name you should have heard already, but possibly haven't. Uh, name was by the name of a young man by the name of Asaph Philip, Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph. So give me a picture of A. Philip Randolph. Uh, should be floating around. Yeah. All right, so A. Philip Randolph was an, an, an organizer and a press man. And there's a relationship between good... Um, organizers and good press people because in order to actually lead a movement you need press. I don't know where the civil rights movement would have been without those photos of dogs being sicked on to, to, to young Negroes who wanted to vote. So you need a press. So A. Philip Randolph um, was a, a, a union organizer in addition to a press man because it doesn't matter what kind of good work you do, especially good work during non-justice, if at the end of the day, uh, nobody knows about it. So you need to reach people, and you need to reach people who might not want to be reached. So we're going to talk a little bit later, because I have ideas about a press here in Athens, Georgia. But um, A. Philip Randolph was a union organizer and a press guy. He organized the Pullman's. Uh, Porters. And there's actually a really good movie about this. I know there's some good books out there, and but like... Some of you guys are very busy and you work and like sometimes you just want to watch a movie. There's a very good movie about this called 10,000 Black Men Named George. Can you give him, the, uh, give him a, uh, a video? It's a very good movie. Track it down. It's worth it because you need to see what black people can do when we organize. And it actually shows this in a, in a moderately compelling way, uh, way. And you should know in general who A. Philip Randolph is just as a black leader. Um, you should know. So check out this movie. Grab it. Watch it with your kids. Watch it with your spouse. Watch it at a family reunion and then talk about it and, and what that means and the trials and tribulations and what that means to organize black people for justice. A. Philip Randolph believed in um, a federal job guarantee because the government needs to be the employer of last resort and make sure that all citizens as citizens have an income because if you don't have an income and actually say in your working conditions, you're just a slave. America's not made for people without a little bit of disposable money. And I'm not just talking about subsistence. I'm not talking about welfare. I'm talking about a job with over subsistence money, with disposable cash so that you can save up for a down payment, so that you can take your family on a vacation, so you can actually live the kind of things that you're supposed to be able to... Um, and the way you're supposed to live as a free American. Because if you don't have more than subsistence money, you're not actually free. Because you can't do the things that cost money. And everything in America costs money. That's why they call it money. Um, so 
you need more than a subsistence uh, income, or you need access to more than subsistence income if you want to start a business. Businesses take capital. Doesn't matter how all the, you can have all the great ideas that you want. If you don't have capital, you are not in the game. You need capital to start businesses, and you can't have capital. You can't build capital off of welfare, right? So he wanted everyone to have access to a job um, where they not only had um, access to a job, but actually say in the working conditions of that job. And that's why you go through a union. So you have say in the working conditions of a job. Because if you don't know, freedom has two parts. People don't tell you this because well, people don't know and they don't think. But the good news is I happen to study this stuff for a living. So freedom has two parts. One, it's just choice. You know, choice among different options. Two is um, say in the content of your options. Right? And if you don't have those two parts together, then you're not really free. For example, if you're a vegetarian and someone gives you a choice of 18 different meat dishes, you have choices, but you're not free because none of those choices are reflective of you. Right? So in order to really be free, you need um, choices among options and also a say, a fair say in the content of those choices. And then you're free. Right? So um, it's not enough to have choices of jobs at all crappy. You need a union so that you can negotiate the working conditions of those jobs and so that they're fair, so that you're not just a slave, so you're not just um, you know, vulnerable. Okay, so A. Philip Randolph. He was one of the organizers of the 63 March on Washington after he organized the, 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 the Pullman Porters, and he wanted it. Uh, the slogan of the march to be um, civil rights plus uh, full employment equals freedom. Because it's not enough to have rights. You need money and money you get from a job in order to actually exercise those rights. All the rights in the world doesn't matter if you don't have money to exercise those rights. Honestly, this is the same thing with voting rights, right? You can vote and have the choices, like, I think this last election was, was a great example of it, where you had um, black people trying to vote, decide whether to vote for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. Neither of those people give a damn about black people. Um, make no mistake, Hillary Clinton was a little bit stronger because she wouldn't have done as much damage, possibly. Like, it's all very complicated, but like, just know that neither of those options were about us, right? So, but with money, we could actually get like our own candidate and have a little bit more power. Um, we could vie for office ourselves with a candidate who's about us, not Obama, who wasn't a candidate about us. He was a candidate about the people with the money. So, um, a, uh, a. Philip Randolph understood that you need a good job that's not just subsistence, but more than subsistence so you could actually have influence in the content of your options. So we're gonna move from A. Philip Randolph to um, Bayard Rustin, and I like Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin, he might be my favorite dude. So much son. I named, uh, I just had a son. Uh, he's, well, he's seven months ago. Well, okay, well, I, I, I just uh, <laughs> gave a contribution to the process by which a son is produced. I contributed what good people contributed to the process of birthing a son, um, which is the best part of it. <laughs> um, so, uh, and uh, we named him Bayard because, uh, like I said, we need Bayard Rustin's name to keep going on in the popular imagination. Plus, this is a great way to make sure he doesn't end up an accountant. Um, uh, so, Bayard Osei Frimpong um, was named after Bayard Rustin, who was uh, kind of like the brains of kind of the moves of the civil rights movement. Um, where you move, how you move, why nonviolence is appropriate, like all of these things. He had King's ear. He was also gay, so there was a lot of pressure at the time for him to move out. I don't think King had to move him out, but Bayard stepped back from the front, uh, from the, from the, uh, front line of the movement, but he was always in the back trying to move things, and which is kind of like what we need people to be doing. You don't need, it doesn't, like this movement isn't about you. Even if people don't know who Ayame Yosef Frimpong is, 
they need to know what a federal job guarantee is. So more important than me is, is getting out the message. And Rustin knew that, so he, like, orchestrated um, the, the March on Washington, and he orchestrated a lot of the, the moves that King was, King was making. There's a, a pretty good documentary on him also. There are books. There's actually really good scholarship coming out now. But there's a pretty good documentary uh, on him called Brother Outsider. Can you throw up the uh, picture? Uh, of, yeah. It's actually, it's fine. You can track it down, track it down. I think it's on PBS maybe. But it's actually really good about Bayard Rustin and what he was doing and, and kind of what was going on through his head and his contribution to the civil rights movement and, and what we know about freedom. Now, what he said, um, and remember, he was a labor organizer. He was a civil rights organizer. He worked with a Philip Randolph. There's a lineage here, and you too can be part of that lineage. It's a good lineage. Uh, you too can be part of that lineage uh, because I'm telling you what they said so you can go out and tell your friends as you all watch this video together and understand why a federal job guarantee is important for, um, for black people to ever be free. Now, he said, let me make sure. Oh, I printed out the, oh, okay, no, I have it. All right, so the problem is that, and there's another, uh, there's, there should be another photo with this on, yeah. All right, so just put it up full. Okay. All right, so Rustin said, the problem is that neither individuals nor the private sector of the economy has and can take responsibility for full employment in American society. This is the responsibility of all segments of society and thus finally the government. The Negro and the poor can only be lifted out of poverty when the government takes the responsibility for creating work for those that the private sector can no longer use. That's us, black people. The private sector only really wanted us as property. Now that we're not property anymore, like, oof. Um, all right. So given the impact of automation and cybernation, this means that the, the arguments we hear about automation and globalization and, and cybernation, these are not new arguments. Rustin was worried about them too. There was always a fear that black people were going to be or continue to be disposable and that the private market was going to treat us as it has always done, which is disposable. It's good when you want it, when you want, and when you don't, like, might as well just send us to the ovens. Um, or to jail. So even when slavery was disallowed after the end of the Civil War, like there have always been schemes to get black people to work for not enough, um, for near slave wages or just subsistence wages, not enough to actually be free. And uh, Rustin understood that it's actually, in order for any of us to have rights, we need to exercise those rights. In order to exercise those rights, we need money. So in order to... Um, uh, actually earn money, we need a job. And a job that paid more than subsistence so we could actually exercise our freedoms. And if the other segments of society wasn't going to guarantee us that, um, that income, it needed to be the government insofar as the government guarantees rights. It needs to guarantee a job. And the good news is there's a lot of work to be done, right? So um, a few shows ago, I did a show on, I definitely did one with a vet, but we talked about it here, on hookworms going on in, in Alabama and the entire rural South. Like someone needs to redo those septic work, that, that septic work. It's a good job. We need, it could be a good union job, a good government job um, that we could do. The private industry doesn't care if black people get hookworms. So it's just gonna let those hookworms just kinda worm their way into people's intestines. Um, but we could go in there uh, redo all the septic systems and the, rebuild the crumbling infrastructure in America in general for a good union wage. And d make no mistake, black people, what little money there is, what little black, stable black middle class there is, it's government jobs. It's government jobs because we never had the actual money to, um, to, on a large scale, make a class out of private industry jobs. There are individuals who do okay, and then they hire a few other individuals, often cousins, who do all right. But for the most part, um, the money that we, can, uh, that we spend as black people and can, that can stabilize the black middle class, those are your teachers. 
Those are your nurses. Those are your sanitation workers. Those are your parole officers. All of those people working good union jobs, and that stabilizes the black middle class. All the black money in California is government jobs. Um, you know, people say, like, I know Shonda Rhimes is out there. No, she's one person. Like, as in terms of a class, it's all, like, cops, parole officers, nurses, sanitation workers, longshoremen. It's, it's all employees because as the American economy grows, like, you need to hire employees. But there's a difference between being an employee and being a slave that actually unionized work, black workers in California know that non-unionized black workers in Georgia don't know so, because they're treated like slaves um, because they don't have a say in their working conditions. And the only way you get a say in your working condition is to balance the power between employees and employers. Um, and if you don't balance the power between employees and employers, if you try to negotiate, you'll just get cut off. And this is why Sheryl Sandberg is a problem for the black community. Sheryl Sandberg is the one who's telling people, uh, telling women to lean in. Black people, if you lean in, you'll get fired. If you lean in as a non-unionized black person, they will find another person for you. But as a unionized black person, you lean in and it's called negotiating at a table. Uh, you need to lean in and it's called a slowdown. So Rustin knew that if we're going to guarantee rights, you need to guarantee people a job. And don't let anyone fool you. There are jobs to be done in these United States. Our infrastructure was built in, in you know, 30, 40 years ago. I want to say that building the, the interstates like, was like 40,000 jobs. Like, our infrastructure was built 30, 40 years, years ago. It's crumbling um, down to our nuclear waste containment. It's all crumbling. And so we need to get serious about rebuilding it. And that sounds like a great way to employ black people at good union wages with pensions and like time off for, um, for uh, um, uh, labor and bereavement and all of those things, like all of the things that white employees get just because like they don't get up without health insurance. <laughs> they don't pick up the phone without it. So we need black employees just to be treated like employees and not slaves. And you get that through organizing with a union. And Rustin knew that, a Philip Randolph union, um, a. Philip Randolph knew that. And uh, you know who else knew that? Martin Luther King. So we're going to give up the Martin Luther King quote, uh, the big one, not that one, the other one. Uh, yeah, that one. Is that, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Okay. You want me to say about that? Yeah, that's fine. All right, so this one should say, uh, <laughs> we must develop a federal program of public works, retraining, and jobs for all, so that none, white or black, will have the cause to feel threatened. At the present time, thousands of jobs a week are disappearing in the wake of automation and other production efficiency techniques. This is Martin Luther King saying this in 68. So understand, this is before globalization became like a thing, but he knew that there's no necessary, like unless we guarantee jobs as a matter of right, uh, there's no necessity that we will be free. Because in order to be free, you need to actually exercise your freedom with money. Um, and so King wanted to, to guarantee jobs through federal public works. And which is fine. There might be an FDR. Is there an FDR? I didn't see it. You didn't see it? Uh, okay. All right. So FDR, FDR created a federal jobs program for white people. It's, it, was the w, it was the WPA. It was the CCC. Um, yeah, it was the WPA. It was the CCC. They created 8 million jobs when the market was much weaker than it was today. And they didn't just build roads and bridges. They had cultural artifacts, too. Artists, theaters, um, newspapers. You know, black people, we need a community newspaper because the white newspapers don't quite give us the quality of news we deserve, but news costs money and we don't have a lot of money. So, um, so we need community newspapers. We need a federal jobs program and that will not be automated. That will not be uh, um, globalized. Like no one in Indonesia is gonna take your community newspaper job and we need a community newspaper job. So, we need to think in terms of the needs of our society, that the markets are not going to provide black people because they don't have money, but that we need in order to exercise our rights. Right? So you're not free unless you can 
start a business tied to your church and actually mean something. Um, black tithe don't mean black tithe almost matter. White tithes matter more. That's why white churches eat black churches. Like it's it's really like. Um, so we need salaries that actually allow people to tithe and sustain churches. We need salaries that allow people to actually give to political candidates and play political defense. So because, you know, understand that gentrification is a political problem. If we had people who actually had our back, we could defend our neighborhoods from developers. But we can't defend our neighborhoods because we can't buy the quality of politicians we need or promote the quality of politicians we need to actually defend our neighborhoods. And that's very important in Athens because it's not a foregone conclusion that there will be black people in Athens, Georgia um, in 25 years. This, these neighborhoods are looking really scrumptious for white developers and, and when they take them, like we're not going to have the political defense unless we organize and organizing takes money. And organizing also takes a press. Also, Anyone at home who's grateful that I do this every week, give the quality of black education that we need in order to get uh, justice, needs to go to thefunkyacademic.com and kick down. Your, your gratitude is welcomed, but gratitude does not pay the rent on this place. Gratitude does not pay for cameras. Gratitude does not pay for the quality of programming we need in order for us to be free. I want to get a press, a physical press, to move around Athens. Uh, that says this kind of message, except in a physical press. I mean, they want to pay people to design it and deliver it and all of that stuff. So go to thefunkyacademic.com and sign up for a monthly. Uh, you can do five, you can do 15, you can do 50, or you can do any amount that you design. And we take credit. So go ahead and do that and handle your business because none of this is free. And we want to keep doing it and we want to grow. Also, black people we got to support black businesses, what black businesses there are. So every week I want to, um, I want to say, I want to say, I want to mention at least two black businesses. One is Broderick Flanagan Studio, which makes all of this possible. I'm filming right now from Broderick Flanagan Studio. Um, you need to show Broderick Flanagan l some love. He does, he's got like many black entrepreneurs. He's got like 15 jobs. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to name two right now. One of them, he's a muralist. He does wonderful work around town in your a public art um, installation in your building. What's up? Oh, no, we came back. We came back. We're good. Okay. In, in, um, in your building, in your, on a wall, in your backyard. Uh, he's very good. That's, that's, that's a job. He also does art classes, and I, and I know he helps a lot of businesses with their corporate retreats and like, just like de-stressing because, you know, it's, it's very stressful running things. And like, you want your people to bond, and there's no better way to bond than all come together and learn how to paint. And that's what Broderick can do. So go ahead and track down Broderick Flanagan at Broderick Flanagan Studios and hire him out for your corporate retreat or hire him out for your bat mitzvah or your quinceanera or for your, for your workshop. Um, he's fantastic. Your Sunday school class, if they need some art, it could be very, very, very cathartic to, to, um, to, to, to learn how to do that. It's a holy, it's holy work. So Broderick does that. Also, he connects businesses with, uh, he connects white businesses with businesses who know they should be hiring black people, but they don't know too many black people because they went to segregated schools and all the segregated fraternities and all the segregated churches and all their people are white. Uh, you talk to Bradrick, he runs Enlightenment Media Productions. He not only will track down um, the black business for your need, if you need a new roof, if you need, um, uh, you know, beauticians for your wedding, if you need a photographer, if you need a, someone to go in and fix your, your heater, um, Broder can, will track them down and he'll work with the black business to make sure that that business meets your needs. So track down Broderick Flanagan. It's very reasonable rates and you owe the black community because in Athens, there's an $8.5 billion GDP and not nearly enough of that money goes to black people. Um, so track down Broderick, he'll hook you up. Also, the other business, yeah, the other business we're going to, to pump this week is Rashi's. Rashi's cuisine is delicious. It's also Jamaican. So if you're having a little party and you need it catered, catered you need to go to Rashi's. It's fantastic. It's local. I'm sure she delivers for the right price. I know she delivers for the right price. And, um... It's Jamaican, which means delicious. You can, they can jerk everything, not just chicken. 
Like, very creative people. So, ginger beer, the whole thing. Uh, so Rashid's, the phone number there is 706-850-4164. Once again, that's 706-850-4164. Hook up Rashid's. It'll be the quality that you deserve, the quality of uh, cuisine that you deserve for your function. And honestly, what you need to do is get Rashi a contract for your business. Like if you're working in a business downtown, if you're a university person, like you need to work, you need to get Rashi's a contract. I heard this great story about the Classic Center when they opened it. They, uh, they gave the catering contract exclusively for 15 years to a white company. You know what that is? You know, the Classic Center is this huge... Um, business that's downtown. They built it, had the Olympics, now they have weddings and all that. 15 years of an exclusive catering contract. Do you know what that means? That means not only the caterer um, gets money, that means all their like ne'er do well cousins now have a job to go and be servers. That means for 15 years, a big drivers, um, like, and all of them, and none of those people got to be black because they all went to, like, cousins and church members and, like, friends of the caterer, the white caterer who got that contract for 15 years, right? So if Rashid has a contract, a contract like that, like, she'll be good. Do that. Um, also, just know also that most black people work for somebody. And so insofar as they are employees, they need to be em employed well. And in order to be employed well, that means you need to not only be able to pick your job to a degree, have a say in picking your job, but also have a say in the working conditions of that job. And that's why you have um, a union. A. Philip Randolph knew that. Bayard Rustin knew that. Martin Luther King knew that. Um, also, you wonder, would you believe who also knew that? Coretta Scott King. Do you have a, the, the um, so Martin Luther King dies fighting for sanitation workers. By the way, I just found out uh, the details about the Memphis sanitation strike. It's fascinating. There's a book by Michael Honey that's written about it. I'm reading it now. I'm going to do a whole show on this as we get closer to April 4th when King was dying. and it becomes the, uh, the, the, the 50th anniversary of his assassination. The Memphis strike is fascinating. It, it, the, the, the real impetus was uh, two garbage workers were killed. Two, two sanitation workers were killed, and they've been trying to organize prior to that, but would you believe the black churches weren't interested because they were scared of the work, and the black middle class was, wasn't interested uh, because, you know, for reasons of class politics. Um, so these two cats were killed, and they'd been trying to organize uh, for that, but once they got killed, they got a lot of energy because they got better press. You know, a Negro has to die before you get the press you deserve. That's why we need our own press. That's why I need you going to this uh, website and kicking in a little bit of money so I can sell my own press so that, like, nobody has to get shot in the street before we actually get these issues the quality of airtime they deserve. So two cats had to die, and that's what got the movement started. Um, I'm going to do a whole show on the Memphis sanitation strike because it's fascinating for myriad reasons. Just know that after King was died, Coretta Scott King excuse me, knew the score, and she um, started the, uh, um, organized a group for, organized a campaign for a federal job guarantee. Because King knew, and there are some great speeches. In school, you learn a little bit about the letter from uh, Birmingham jail, and you learn a little bit about, uh, you know, I have a dream. But the speech you need to read is The Other America. Um, the other America, it's where he talks about it. It's a speech he gave in 67 and 68. He gave a lot, he gave a lot, he gave some of the speeches a few times, but that's a speech he gave in 67 and 68. He gave it at Stanford, he gave it to a union hall, he gave it in Gross Point, Michigan. Um, it's called The Other America. It's where it lays out about how, like, all right, so we fought for civil rights, but now black people are broke, and that doesn't mean anything. And so like, the rights don't really mean anything if you don't have the money to exercise them. You can integrate a lunch counter, but if you can't afford what's on the menu, does it really matter? And since real power is in production, if you can't save up and get with some friends to actually start your own restaurant, does it really matter? Yeah, real power is, is actually in production. Um, that's why black labor power ma matters so much. So Coretta Scott King, once MLK dies, she knows the score. 
She knows the score. She didn't like. She knew that jobs, jobs, jobs was what King was King. The Kings needed for black people to have justice because good jobs stabilize communities, and communities, once they're stabilized, can actually be self-determined. Because if everyone you know is broke, you're prey. You're not. You're not. You can't do self-determination. You can't like have your own organizations. You'll do whatever some wealthy 501c3 donor wants you to do. And you'll be nice to them, too. You'll tell them that they're very nice, Miss Ann, Miss Jan. It's always going to be someone's wife. Miss, <laughs> Miss, um, uh, to, 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 you're going to be going there and kissing their butt for a donation because you don't have um, enough dues money in your group to, uh, to actually sustain the quality of institutions you need to advocate the way you need to. Right, right. So, like, you like, so I want to transition black communities from donor based communities to dues based communities. So, we don't get our justice through donor based organizations, we get our justice through dues based organizations. And that's how we'll be able to self determine ourselves um, like, and our life. And we won't be prey upon by developers. Because a lot of what I'm talking about is political defense, black like political defense from uh, developers who have the political contacts to eminent domain your house. <laughs> they have the political de contacts to eminent domain your school. Or they'll just close your school. Um, uh, yeah, so if you don't have a political defense, then you're food for the people who have a political offense. And, ja, and the, there's a second uh, MLK quote that I forgot. We're going to... Go back in history. MLK is still alive. And there's a second MLK quote I'm going to read. All right. Here it comes. The orientation should be jobs first, training later. I'll say that again. The orientation should be jobs first, training later. Unfortunately, the job policy of the federal programs has largely been the reverse, with the result that people have been trained for non-existent jobs. Non-existent jobs. Right? You need jobs for freedom. You don't need training for freedom, because training then allows you to be food for a racialized labor market. So you spend all of your time getting training and then have to deal with an HR office, sir, who like just wants to hire his cousin anyway. And his cousin ain't you. So, um, or a hiring manager who, who just wants to hire their nephew anyway. So what these training programs do is shift all of the risk onto the black community. Now, understand what that means. The Negro problem is America's problem. We were, we were degraded for hundreds of years and then set three, free and then terrorized for another 150 years. Um, so it's America's problem. It's America's problem to redress. When you shift the responsibility for America's problem onto the black com uh, community, not only do you doubly burden the black community with America's problem, you give white America uh, uh, an, uh, um, a holiday from their political responsibility. It's the equivalent of like politicians letting everyone else's son go to fight a war while their son stays great. So great. Like we've given white America a holiday from dealing with the American problem and shunted the American problem into the black community as a black problem. So when you give the black community education uh, solutions or training solutions, you've still disproportionately shunted the risk of not having a job into the black community. All right? So we need to share that risk guarantee a job, we'll do training on the job, and know that even as they're being trained, they're getting paid. Um, and that's what justice looks like. And that's what a black community uh, that's whole looks like. And I'm going to say a little bit, I'm going to start winding down pretty soon. But understand that black politics is revolutionary politics. And you know who else's politics is revolutionary politics? White politics. White politics was revolutionary politics. They had a revolution in 1776. They had another revolution. Pretty much FDR, like I've done some um, research in the 30s prior, uh, the 20s and 30s prior to uh, FDR's New Deal. It was a revolution. It was a revolution. That made the white middle class. All of those alphabet agencies we kind of study, we don't understand that America, like American white people were in a bad way. Um, and they were food for the bankers. 
They were food for the employers. So we shored up the, 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 their unions with the NLRA, the National Labor Relations Act. He shored up their housing, like their stability um, with the FHA that pretty much guaranteed mortgages just for white people. Um, he showed up with, like I said, eight million, do eight million jobs, not just like shovel-ready jobs, but doing theaters and newspapers and arts um, with the WPA and the CCC. And a lot of that work is still with us today. Uh, like, so he did the quality of revolutionary politics for white America uh, because he needed Southern Democrat supports and Southern Democrats are racist, so they're like, sure, well, will revolutionize America for white people as long as it's only for white people because we like the racial order. And FDR was like, cool. Because, remember, FDR was also the naval secretary for Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson was, <laughs> was another one of those uh, progressive um, um, uh, Democrats who could give the number of poops he gave about black people. He had Woodrow Wilson mass demoted uh, the black labor force in the federal government. So like if you were black and you worked for the government and then Woodrow Wilson became president and he's just like, nope, we don't need you anymore. And just promoted white people instead. Very good for white poor, awful for black people. Um, FDR was his naval secretary. When FDR was president, he turned it up, revolutionized, stabilized white America. Um, and with programs that were so popular, like the WPA and the CCC, these programs were so popular that they had to actually make a rule so that he couldn't run again. Like that's the quality of politics he was, he was, he was doing for white people. So black people, we need a quality of revolutionary polity, politics that will stabilize our community because we were never made whole. We never got our new deal. Um, so to be black, and to care about black communities is to be in need of a revolutionary politics. And anybody who's not talking about a revolutionary politics is not serious about stabilizing the black community. They're not serious about getting the hookworms out of our land or the lead out of our water. And paying black people a fair wage to do it because these are needful things. Um, elder care, child care. This stuff isn't going to be automated or offshored. Elder care, child care, uh, uh, the federal job guarantee. Um, I mean, elder care, child care, uh, deferred maintenance, um, uh, you know, getting these class sizes down. Because it turns out poor people need smaller class sizes because they come from poor people, like, and they're surrounded by, like, fewer books. So they need smaller class sizes and more one-on-one -on -one attention. So, like, if we actually want those people to not be punished for being born poor or being born degraded, we need to actually get them the, the support they need so that they too have their rights. We need to make the appropriate accommodations. And all of those are jobs. All of those jobs, all of those are jobs that we could actually like, fulfill by hiring black people. So, who's talking about a federal job guarantee besides those civil rights leaders, FDR and McGovern? There's a clip I couldn't prepare because it's locked in a, uh, copyright issues. Let's well, talk about a federal job guarantee. You know who else? Guys, I can get Win uh, Richard Dean Winfield. Mm -hmm. All right, am I? Are we off? Uh, yeah, we just went off. All right, so we're back on. Yeah. All right, so there's a guy, Richard Dean Winfield. He's running for Congress in Georgia 10. That's Athens. Um, that's Athens District. It goes from Athens down to Milledgeville, over almost to Statesboro. Um, a guy by name of Francis Johnson is running in District 12 over in Statesboro. He's a pretty interesting cat. And he's also down with the unfinished work of King, which means a federal job guarantee. But in Athens, Richard Dean Winfield is running on a federal jobs guarantee because he understands that unless you have money to spend, you don't really have rights. And unless you're participating in civil society, that means like actually working or, or in clubs and actually participating in civil society, you're alienated from the freedom that me that you that's required in order to be American and American. And you don't want to be alienated, you want to be in civil society, and you want enough money so that civil society actually re um, reflects you. So you want to be like starting your own organizations and paying tithes to the church you want and all of that stuff. Not just be like food and pray for the predators of civil society. There's a great article about him. I think I put it in the description of this video. 
I know I did. It's in the nation. Put it up, Matthew. Um, read this article. It's in the description of the video. And not only read this article, you know who else has been talking about King's Legacy? Um, a guy by the name of Bishop Barber. Uh, uh, Reverend, uh, Reverend William Barber. Reverend William Barber. Um, so what I'm going to need you to do, how many people are watching? 120. 120? 120 people. What I'm going to need you to do is I'm going to need you to tweet. Tweet Reverend Barber this show and the link to um, the article on Winfield in the nation, right? I'm going to need you to tweet Reverend Barber, and uh, I guess the hashtag is Moral Mondays, or uh, the hashtag is, is what? The hashtag is the Poor People's Campaign. I'm going to need you to tweet. We need, it, he's kind of a hard guy to get a hold of, so I'm going to need your help to get a hold of him. So tweet this video, tweet the Nation article, um, tweet Barber, get him on board with the federal job guarantee, remind him that this is the unfinished work of, of, of King's legacy. So say Coretta, uh, Coretta Scott King, so say um, Martin Luther King, so say Bayard Rustin, so say A. Philip Randolph. Uh, and this can happen we all need to come together. Sandy Darity is already on board with the Winfield campaign. You know you've, he you've heard me talk about Sandy Darity because uh, he also, and that's another guy uh, who, who understands this. Sandy Darity is an economist, a wealth economist, one of the premier wealth economists in the nation. He's at Duke University. Um, he understands that the federal job guarantee and another program called Baby Bonds are really the only two universal programs that will make the black community whole. So it's not like we have a bunch of options. We need a guaranteed job because the private sector won't take us. For us to have any of our rights, we need a guaranteed job, excuse me, and we need it at a living wage, um, at a fair wage. And we should tweet uh, Killer Mike too, if he comes in. Yeah, go ahead and tweet Killer Mike. He's coming out and asking for Oh yeah, run the, run, run the, yeah. is this, is this, run the jewels? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I'm not cool anymore. I don't. <laughs> I used to be cool. Then, uh, What's that mean? Oh, uh, I'd run, run the jewels. Uh, I could crib walk. What does that mean? Oh, uh, yeah. It's, it's, uh, Killer Mike is a, is a hip hop artist based out of Atlanta. Uh, it's got dope politics. got a great song on Reagan. Owns some barbershops. Uh, good guy coming into Athens. We need Killer Mike on this. We need Killer Mike with Winfield, actually. Uh, talking about uh, jobs, that'd be fantastic. So, so go ahead and, and tweet Killer Mike, because um, yeah, because a federal job guarantee is is the way we're gonna get free. And I don't want another 50 years um, for us to figure this out. Like they've already done the intellectual and the legwork. This only wins with a federal job guarantee. The private market will not hire poor black people at the rates we need. Um, if we're going to have rights, part of having those rights is having the right, a real right to work, a right to a job, and have that job be at a fair wage, not like, um, yeah. And people say, like, what about a minimum wage, just lifting the minimum wage up to 15? That doesn't, that doesn't help because um, if you don't do something about, one, immigration, two, uh, yeah, if you just don't provide in incentives, we'll just get locked out of the, the, the labor market if you, if, you, if, you, if you raise minimum wage without a federal job guarantee. So we need to actually just be honest to say that we need a federal job guarantee. And we need a federal job guarantee at a fair wage. And up until 1973, when wages were pegged to productivity, um, something happened in 73. Different theories. We started fetishizing managers in a weird way. We started, um, yeah, the women entered the market in a different way and didn't want to respect them. So it, it became, things became complicated in 73. But up until 73, wages were pegged with productivity. And then after 73, productivity went up, wages stagnated. So if productivity, if wages had stayed with productivity, we'd be at about two, $22 an hour. Winfield's running on $20 an hour. You just need $20 an hour. And $20 is enough to not only have um, 
have subsistence, but to actually tithe. If every black person you knew made $20 an hour and knew that coming out of jail, coming out of high school, they were guaranteed a job doing good work, making $20 an hour, our community would be revolutionized. We could say things to these white nonprofit donors that you would only dream of saying. Because uh, we wouldn't need their money, we'd be able to do it um, as a dues-based organization. And that's what self-determination looks like. Uh, we'd have our own press. Because at $20 an hour, you could actually afford to get a subscription that comes to your home. Also, Democrats need to get on this because if you don't watch out, Democrats, black people are not going to go on for the immigration talk in the party. Right? So when Trump says immigration, you know what white people hear? They hear jobs. I know, black, I know liberal Democrats hear like, oh, you know, broken families and all that stuff. No, white people hear jobs. They don't care about broken families or any of that. They're like, well, you know, if fewer um, immigrants are here and fewer illegal immigrants are here, that means we'll have more bargaining power and our wages will go up. And honestly, the truth is, I've been talking to people at the chicken factory, uh, the wages have already started to increase now that Trump is uh, like... Um, uh, uh, is cracking down on internal illegal immigration. So, look, if you want actually like, to open borders, if you want to actually keep families together, if you don't want to punish illegal immigrants, you need to back a federal job guarantee. Not just an upper minimum wage, but a federal job guarantee. Um, and that way, you neuter the argument, the subliminal argument that that, that open borders will lead to a lower quality of life because it'll flood the market with um, immigrants. And right now we're at a zero, zero immigration threshold, but at the low wage level, that might not matter um, because whatever immigrants are coming, like are either taken here or they're here, uh, are, are coming for us. Um, so if you care about immigration, white liberals, if you care about open borders, you need to care about a federal job guarantee. Because if you do that, all of the steam out of the Republican anti-immigration talk goes away. You take away the argument that they're, they're, they're coming to steal our jobs. And that's the worry. Make no mistake, that's the worry. That's also what's governing the tax plan, the tax cut. You know, if we give wealthy people money, maybe they'll start hiring more. You take away all of those arguments if you guarantee people a job at a fair wage doing work that we need done, deferred maintenance on old people's houses. Look, in about 10 to 15 years, 1.8 million haulers and truckers are going to lose their jobs because we'll actually figure out how to make these self-driving cars work. We need a plan in play now. So that, and you know, a lot of these truckers are white and they don't mess around. They miss a meal, they start breaking stuff. Um, so we need a plan in play now. Um, that guarantees people's rights and lowers people's blood pressure um, concerning economic anxiety. And I worry that the Democrats don't have a real labor policy. We're too busy talking about other things. So that's why we don't have a real labor policy. If you don't have a real labor policy, that means you don't have a real racial justice policy. So we got black people giving all of their votes to a party without a real, a substantive racial justice pro uh, program or a substantive labor program. I think that's a problem. Um, so we need to use our force to remind people what a substantive racial justice program looks like, what it would take to make black people whole. And we need to tell everybody, which is why I need you to post this video on Facebook. On, I need you to tweet it out to your friends. Send it out to your listservs, to your book group. Um, actually, for your next book group, just watch this video. And then like talk about it, because not all you guys read the book anyway. So um, for your next book group, watch this video and then talk about it. Yeah, send it out to your people. Send it, put this on your church listserv in your Sunday. Yeah, in your Sunday school. Like it's the Lord's work we're doing right here. I'm trying to increase your tithe. Um, so I want to thank you for taking the time to, to, to do this with me, to talk about the federal job guarantee as racial justice, to know about its lineage, 
watch the movies that, um, or read the books. There, there are great books on these people also. I, I, know, I know you're busy. So watch the movie, 10,000 Black Men Named George on A. Philip Randolph, and um, uh, the, the Bayard Rustin movie. Which one was it? Um, uh, uh, under, uh, Brother Outsider. Brother Outsider. Go ahead and put the, the, the thing on. Watch it. Right, and um, know that these guys knew that this begins and ends with getting black people good jobs. Good jobs. So that they can support black businesses and so that we could all be stable and we can not be preyed upon. FDR did the revolutionary politics necessary for the white community. I'm going to need you people watching at home to take seriously the program that it would take for the black community. Thank you for your time. If you like what I'm doing, go on ahead and go to thefunkyacademic.com or just funkyacademic.com. I got both domains now. I'm building. Um, uh, and let's get this press going. And tell your friends, donate, set up a monthly. I'll see you next week. Peace.